Thanks so much for joining us as we take you around San Diego. I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. So we'll begin with new numbers that are out on the city of San Diego's efforts to clear out homeless encampments. It's been four months since police started cracking down on encampments on public property. CBS 8's David Godfordson takes a closer look at what's happening downtown. I've been out here on the streets two years and I've been here in San Diego like six years. Tara Chaffee is living in a tent downtown near the 163 freeway. Do they come by here and try to clear you out? Yeah, they do. They come by and, and do a cleanup. So we have to clear all of our stuff out so they can do the cleanup. And then a while after that, we can come back. Under the city's unsafe camping ordinance, police can issue citations to people living on public property. The new law went into effect on August 1st. Since then, officers have made one arrest issued nine citations and given warnings to 177 people living on the streets. The city says they only arrest people as a last resort. Instead, they try to get people to move off the streets and into a shelter like these two tent cities near Balboa Park, also called safe sleeping areas. Tim Lucy lives right next door to one of them. If I had no place to go and that was offered to me, I, uh, if it was safe, I think that's a great deal for a night. I, I don't think it's a permanent solution. This man named Mike tells me he's a veteran living on the streets downtown. What's it going to take for you to get shelter? I own a home. He says the city does come by offering him help, but he's not moving. So you don't want to move into a city shelter? I don't. For free? I, no. No, I don't want nothing free in life except air. Tara told me she had recently lived in one of those safe sleeping areas and she had nothing but praise for the city. They're actually a wonderful, you know, they have the power, people can shower, um, they help people get their IDs, uh, get jobs. So no, it's a really good thing they're doing. I think it's a really good thing. Unfortunately, it didn't last long, she says, due to a domestic violence incident in the city shelter. Um, I got kicked out and I'm fighting to get back in and I've had problem after problem. So I just, you know, got to prove myself that, you know, that won't happen again, I guess is the best way to say it. The city says they try to avoid arresting people. The goal is to encourage people to get off the street and seek shelter. In downtown San Diego, David Godfordson, CBS 8. David, thank you. And California will use nearly $300 million to address homeless encampments near state roads. Governor Gavin Newsom saying it could get at least 10,000 people off the streets. The money will be distributed as grants to local cities and counties. A Caltrans spokesperson said that any piece of land being used for transportation purposes qualify for this new effort. That includes bike paths, park and rides, and highways. This says we've learned 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That's according to a recent study by Lending Club. And according to Bankrate's annual emergency fund report from the start of 2023, 57% of Americans cannot cover a $1,000 emergency expense. This all comes after U.S. News & World Report ranked San Diego the most expensive place to live in the U.S. Even working a full-time job, it's not enough. You have to have multiple ways of income. Otherwise, it's going to be hard. It just is. Yeah, University of San Diego economics professor Alan Jin says people can do several things to cut their spending, like reviewing any ongoing subscriptions, eat at home instead of going out, and turn your thermostat um, this winter to save, turn it down to save on your utility bill. This says home prices keep going up. San Diego's home prices came in second place for the fastest rate increase in the country. Detroit, Michigan took the number one spot. In San Diego, the prices are up, which is good news for sellers, but bad news for those looking to buy. San Diego is second on the um, S&P Case Sheller Home Price Index. Prices went up 6.5% from September. It is San Diego's highest rank in two years, but there could be good news on the horizon for buyers soon. Housing prices are recovering. They had a modest decline toward the, in the last half of last year, uh, and, and that decline is over. Unless there were a major economic dislocation, uh, you would expect the trend of, of strong prices to, uh, to continue at least for somewhat longer. 
Now just below San Diego are cities like New York, Chicago, Boston and LA. Well, a statewide task force is in San Diego trying to figure out how to prevent fraud in charter schools. This week's meeting came more than four years after a group of people, including educators from San Diego, were charged with stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from the state. CBS 8 Shannon Handy has details on that and what the task force hopes to accomplish. This was the largest charter school fraud case ever discovered in the United States. It's centered right here in San Diego. The task force is meeting to figure out ways to ensure it never happens again. They defrauded California families and the state by enrolling fake students into online charter school. Specifically, the school was called A3. Malia Cohen was an elected California state controller until years after the fraud occurred, but says when she found out the details, she was infuriated. The scheme resulted in a theft of approximately $400 million from the state. Uh, we believe that we will be able to recover 215 million, but obviously that is not enough. Cohen now chairs an 18 member statewide task force who met for the first time today at the Logan Memorial Educational Campus. The group formed as part of a court order from this case, which was initiated and prosecuted in San Diego. In 2019, the district attorney's office announced criminal charges against an Australian man and his Long Beach based business partner, as well as nine co-conspirators for opening 19 charter schools in San Diego and elsewhere to defraud the state. The scheme involved using names, report cards, and student information of roughly 40,000 students, including ones from the Dehees Elementary School District in El Cajon. A3 Education will receive between two and $5,000 per child from the state. In the Dehees School District, which has fewer than 150 full-time students, A3 Education received funding for nearly 20,000 students during the 2017-2018 school year. Those charged included former Dehisa School District Superintendent Nancy Hauer and Stephen Van Zant, former superintendent of the Mountain Empire Unified School District. The prosecution was successful, but that is not enough. We know there are other greedy people out there that will also try to game the system. Today's task force meeting is the first of many planned throughout the next year. The group, which consists of San Diego Unified School Board members, is tasked with addressing issues regarding the school auditing process, specifically the fact schools can hire their own auditors who can help facilitate fraud. They will present their findings and recommendations by the end of June. Our goal is to make sure that public dollars that are designated to go to education go exactly there and are not diverted by greedy fraudsters who want to line their pockets. Shannon Handy, CBS 8. Shannon, thanks. As always, well, in this an hours long SWAT standoff in Ramona came to a peaceful end on Tuesday night with a man wanted for assault in police custody. 29 year old Christopher Payne was arrested just after 830. It all started around 1130 AM on Tuesday at a home in City Heights. San Diego police were called in after Payne allegedly fought someone and hit them with a gun. Payne then drove off with officers following him to a large building on Vista Ramona Road where he barricaded himself inside. SWAT was then called to try and get him out. Police say Payne finally surrendered after SWAT teams used flashbangs and tear gas. Well, Jacqueline Ma's preliminary hearing set for this week was postponed. Ma is the former National City teacher accused of having an inappropriate relationship with two young boys. Her preliminary hearing has been pushed back to December 12th. That's because right now both sides are working toward a plea deal, which would prevent them from having to go to trial. The judge did warn the preliminary hearing will go forward in December and the court will not continue it again. Ma faces numerous sexual misconduct charges. She is accused of lewd behavior with one student and engaging in sex acts with another. Ma is being held without bail at the Las Colinas jail. And a North County school counselor accused of molesting a 13 year old student is pleading not guilty. Oceanside police arrested 27 year old Connor Chanove after the teen's mother says she found them in a car together. He worked as a counselor at the girls school and was employed by the Vista Unified School District. Bail was set at $325,000. Well, a man shot multiple times by sheriff's deputies is talking about the incident 
and says he is grateful to be alive. Eric Talavera was hit by more than a dozen bullets. Now he is suing the county and the deputies who shot him, alleging they were so reckless that one of their bullets hit another officer at the scene. CBS 8 Steve Price was there as Talavera spoke and has more on that lawsuit. A man shot multiple times by sheriff's deputies is now suing the county and the deputies who opened fire. Now he admits that he stole a trailer, but he says the deputies used excessive force while trying to arrest him. Do not move. It happened in February of 2022. Eric Talavera shot 16 times by the two deputies. Here's the shirt he was wearing. You can see several of the bullet holes. I know there are people who might say I brought this on myself. No one should be killed for taking a trailer. I was desperate and, and homeless and got involved in taking a trailer to try to survive. Talavera had a knife on him. Deputy David Lovejoy, who investigators later determined fired 12 rounds, said he thought it was a gun. Get on the ground! Investigators say Deputy Jonathan Young, who was wearing the body camera that took this footage, fired five shots. I spent months in the hospital some of which I do not remember at all. I was unconscious. Talavera's attorney says the deputies made several mistakes while handling this situation and that an independent review agreed. The Citizen Oversight Board found that he was complying with their commands to get on the ground when they opened fire. One of the rounds fired hit a National City Police detective at the scene. He is also suing the county and the two deputies alleging excessive force, adding that the deputies, quote, were not concerned with the safety of law enforcement officers on scene or bystanders when they fired their weapons. Mr. Talavera was surrendering to the deputies when they shot him. Talavera's attorneys believe Deputy Lovejoy shouldn't have even been with the department when their client was shot, pointing to an incident in 2020 when a woman says he pulled her out of her car by her hair during a traffic stop, ripping several braids out of her head. He says Lovejoy should have been fired right then and there. The county knew about Lovejoy's history before this incident be began. The county says they can't comment on this lawsuit because of pending litigation. Talavera's attorneys are seeking monetary compensation for what their client has gone through and what he'll have to deal with physically and emotionally for the rest of his life, an amount they believe to be in the tens of millions of dollars. In downtown, Steve Price, CBS 8. Steve, thank you. And two animal rights groups are suing the Padres and C5 Rodeo over a rodeo that's planned at Petco Park in January. The Animal Protection League and the group showing animals respect and kindness says the event violates municipal codes, which prohibits non-service animals inside and around Petco Park. Tuesday, they asked a judge to issue a temporary restraining order, which would stop ticket sales. The judge continued the matter until December 14th. Attorneys for the Padres and C5 Rodeo declined to comment. Well, we are learning the Chula Vista City Council is looking over the city's long-term financial plan. Tuesday, an annual meeting was held to provide a guideline for future budgets. The city had a balanced budget at the beginning of the year, but they anticipate budget deficits in 2025 through 2027. The outlook changes for the better after that, but um, with an expected budget surplus through 2034. Mayor John McCann told CBS 8 he is optimistic about the next decade of growth in Chula Vista. This is going to be Chula Vista's decade because we've worked on laying the foundation to be an economic driver, not just for the city of Chula Vista, but for the region. And now we're actually making it happen. Yeah, Mayor McCann also said that infrastructure projects like the Bayfront redevelopment will bring in billions of dollars and create thousands of jobs. It's really taken shape in the South Bay. Well, a La Jolla man who got conned out of $18,000 in a wire fraud scam has some good news to share. His bank reimbursed the money. No questions asked. CBS 8's David Godfredson has the happy ending in this Working For You report. How old are your kids? Uh, 18, 17, the twins are 12, and the youngest is 8. Mark Del Muro is a father of five who got conned out of $18,000 in a bank wire fraud scam. He really needed that money for his family during the holidays. You know, braces, clothes, property tax. <laughs> 
Ten days ago, Mark agreed to be interviewed on camera, telling his story to CBS 8 so that other people might not fall victim to the same scam. A con man had called Mark pretending to be with the U.S. Bank Fraud Division. The scammer was able to change Mark's password and wire transfer the 18 grand to the East Coast. La Jolla man is sharing a warning tonight after getting conned. His story went viral with 90,000 views on YouTube. I reached out to U.S. Bank and the Vice President of Public Affairs promised to take another look at Mark's case. Then on the day before Thanksgiving. Lo and behold, there's 18,000 and change in our savings account. No notice, no call from the bank. The $18,000 was simply transferred back in. I think all the views from YouTube and the great coverage that San Diego News 8 did for me uh, really put a spotlight on the problem of fraud and wire fraud. Mark says he learned a valuable lesson, if in doubt. Just hang up and call back. You know, it may be inconvenient, but uh, at least you know. Mark was so grateful to CBS 8, he showed up at the TV station with a gift-wrapped present for his favorite reporter, a wireless toolkit, just to say thank you for all our efforts. Now, unfortunately, I cannot accept that $200 toolkit because our parent company has rules against payola. But on the upside, U.S. Bank did the right thing. They refunded Mark's money, and my faith in the U.S. banking industry is almost entirely restored. In La Jolla, David Goffertson, CBS 8. David, thank you. Interesting. Well, of course, we are working for you, finding out who owns the old Jimmy's Family Restaurant in Chula Vista and what the property's plan is. The building has been vacant for years now, and neighbors in the area say it's an eyesore. The county recorder's office told us that the building and the rest of the Oxford Center Strip Mall has been owned by Deutsch Chula Vista Oxford Center LLC since 1997. A man in charge of maintenance for the property told us he's given tours to prospective tenants. I showed this for a couple people that um, they're already owners for restaurants and stuff like that, and uh, they like, you know, they like the building, they like the actual parking. I, I don't know. I don't know. They they talked to the owner. Yeah, we reached out to the CEO for the LLC, but have not yet heard back. More of those segments on CBS8.com. Lots of abandoned buildings. Well, Costco was set to take over the lease for the old Sears building at the North County Mall, but now they're pulling out of that deal. Our Brian White is in Escondido with that disappointment. Sears closed here in 2020 and has been vacant ever since. There were high hopes when Costco was planning to move in, but that deal is no longer. I like think that it would be so amazing to have had a Costco there. Like it would have been so convenient. It would have been like 10 minutes from my house. So you would actually go to that Costco? 1,000%. Costco lovers disappointed to hear the news. They just pulled out of the deal. Oh, wow. So they're not going to go in there anymore. Are you disappointed? Yes, I am. I was actually really looking forward to that. Costco Wholesale has withdrawn from an agreement approved by the Escondido City Council last year that would have moved the big box retailer into this vacant Sears building. Like it gives the vibe that our city is not like we're not moving. We're not progressing. We would love to just see something go in there that could really serve our community. Transform Co, the parent company for Sears, owns the lease rights to this city owned property. Costco was planning to purchase the lease from them to renovate the old building and make extensive improvements, including the addition of a gas station. But for reasons unknown, they're pulling out. Did you hear that the deal fell through? I did. I was disappointed to hear that. A spokesperson for the city told CBS 8, quote, the company has asked the city of Escondido to stop working on the development application submitted. All fees were paid by Costco and city staff was prepared to bring the project forward to the planning commission, end quote. So for now, this building here at North County Mall remains vacant. It has been empty. I haven't seen anything go in it and I'm kind of sad for our mall because I'd like to see more business there. Transformco owns the lease rights through 2041, and it's unclear now what they have planned for the site. I hope that it becomes something that would be uh, beneficial for our community. I reached out to Costco for comment as well as Transformco, and neither of them responded. In Escondido, Brian White, CBSA. Brian, thanks. You know we'll keep you posted. 
Well, an act of vandalism all caught on camera. This victim's son is now reaching out to us for help. He says the woman that you just saw in that video keyed his mom's car. CBS 8's Brian White has those details as well. She like goes inside her trunk and she like gets her key out and you can see she comes around and then that's when she keys the car. The victim's son, who doesn't want to be identified by name, says he and his mom were at a doctor's appointment at this Kaiser off Vandiver Avenue in Mission Valley a couple weeks ago. When they came back to the parking garage... We see the scratch all on the whole side of the car. Deep scratches on his mom's 2019 Tesla Model 3. But he was in luck. I immediately got into the car and I checked the dash cam and that's where I went over all the video. The driver's side camera caught the whole thing and he couldn't believe it. We got her the first time that she came through and keyed the car and then she comes around again and she's kind of pretending that her car has something on it even though there's clearly nothing on the video. Then she comes around again and she keys the car for the second time. And I was like, oh my God, it was like gut wrenching. Then the woman gets into a white Honda and backs out. There's her like looking over the car. She's backing out like super slowly and she's really eyeing the damage. There was no front license plate on the suspect's car, but fortunately he had his own car parked behind both of them and got the back license plate on camera. CBS 8 ran the plate. It came back to a woman who lives in San Diego. I gave her a call and she answered. Do you have any knowledge of this happening? We're choosing not to identify her at this time. She said she owns a white Honda, but that she doesn't know anything about the Tesla being keyed. The victim filed a police report hours after it happened, and SDPD told CBS 8 a detective has been assigned to the case. I mean, thing is, like, why did you do this? I asked him if he had maybe dinged her door when they got out of the car. She got there after us. How would we ding her door? Uh, she got there and left before we got to the car. It'll be more than $3,000 to fix and to add salt to injury, the car had actually been paint corrected and ceramic coated a few months earlier. I don't know why someone would ever do this to somebody else's car. Like, and I've got you on video, so. I'm Brian White for CBS 8. Yikes, for sure. We can all do better, right? Hey, well, right now the San Diego Humane Society needs your help finding whoever is abandoning horses in the Tijuana River Valley Regional Park. The Humane Society says in one week they found these two quarter horses abandoned. One of the horses had to be euthanized because of health issues. The other was found with a note that just said for animal control. Investigators believe the animals are from the same owner. They want people to know that it is illegal to abandon a pet or livestock. We really want to try to understand and we want to discourage this from continuing to happen. And San Diego Humane Society is here to help. Yeah, and they are already at max capacity. So if you have any information about the abandoned horses, call the SDHS law enforcement at the number on your screen. That is 619-299-7012. Well, the Aztecs have a new head football coach. San Diego State introduced new hire Sean Lewis this week. We are so hopeful. He is coming from Colorado, where he was the offensive coordinator for Deion Sanders and the Buffaloes. I'm excited to be welcomed and embraced and to lead a tremendous program, a tremendous community that has rich tradition going all the way back to Eric Coriel and what he was able to do and how he revolutionized the game of football and how we throw the football today because of his influence and his impact on the game. Yeah, the man who has so much offensive charisma, his social media bio bears the phrase, life is too short to huddle, meaning he likes a hurry up offense. Rooting for you, SDSU. Well, a local entrepreneur claims persistence and dedication is what helped him follow his dreams to sell a Mexican flavored spicy snack in San Diego. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen introduces us to Danny Schwartz and how he was able to get this Mexican inspired snack on store shelves. A San Diego based Mexican inspired snack company is spicing things up in the community. Danny Schwartz is originally from Monterey, Mexico. He moved to San Diego during the pandemic to start his own business selling spicy snacks. When I moved to the U.S., I was always craving it. So that was the, the, the inspiration behind Chusa to bring something authentic and something that people love and something especially that I will also selfishly love. 
He made cold calls and worked tirelessly. Finally, his products first hit the shelves inside Seaside Market in Cardiff. They are called Chusa. Chusa means something positive. When you hit a Chusa, you hit all the pins in bowling, but you also say it as when you do something amazing, similar to when you say you hit a Grand Slam or a home run. The dried fruit snacks come in many flavors, including pineapple, mango, strawberry, and more. They come smothered in authentic, Mexico spices. While he won't reveal the recipe, <laughs> no. secret? it's a secret, yeah, for sure. He promises the snacks that sell for five to eight dollars per bag contain zero artificial flavors or colors. It has the sweetness of the fruit with with a uh, with a spiciness from our, from our products. Chusa won the first ever Together We Grow $100,000 grant from PepsiCo for successfully expanding to 500 stores. I was euphoric. I was so excited. This included a six-month mentorship program for up-and-coming Hispanic businesses. PepsiCo helped him expand even more by putting his products inside 7-Eleven. You can also buy them at Whole Foods, Ralph's, Bristol Farms, and more. His goal now be the most loved spicy snack and he hopes to inspire other local entrepreneurs to spice it up. Be extremely persistent and believe in what you're doing. So far I've tried the spicy strawberry, spicy mango and spicy pineapple. The spicy pineapple is my favorite so check it out, try it for yourself and choose Chusa. We'll send things back to you. Yeah I can handle a lot of heat as well so I'll have to give it a try. Shop local right? Well, a new landmark in Little Italy was unveiled on Tuesday. It is Piazza Costanza, located at the corner of Columbia and West Ash Streets. It's named in honor of Margaret Midge Costanza. She was a social and political activist who served as the first female assistant to former President Jimmy Carter. Carter said Costanza was his uh, window on America who fought for equality for women, the LGBTQ community, and the elderly. Well, many of us, of course, are getting into the holiday spirit, and that means picking out and putting up your Christmas tree. But what kind of tree is actually the most environmentally friendly? Our Sean Stiles has the answer in this Earth 8 report. With Thanksgiving behind us, everyone's getting into the holiday spirit, and what they're going to be looking for is one of these, a fresh cut Christmas tree. But which is better for the environment, artificial or real? farm raised, farm grown, they were cut, and then they, that land will be replanted on. Mike Osborne and his family have operated the Pinery Christmas tree since 1992. All of their Christmas trees come out of the Pacific Northwest. If somebody is selling, you know, 800,000 trees, uh, you know, they probably have 4 million trees in the ground. Some will say by cutting down living trees, you're removing carbon scrubbers from the forest. For every one of these that is cut in the, in the field, they grow one to two more the following year. The average Christmas tree grows for seven to 10 years and during that time is sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. Its carbon footprint is nothing. It is, it is taking carbon out of, the, out of the atmosphere. It is taking things that aren't supposed to be in the air and it's helping the environment. Mike will concede that transporting from the Pacific Northwest adds to the carbon footprint. If you compare that to a product that is made overseas uh, and has to go on a boat and come all the way across you know, oceans to get here. According to One Tree Planet, you're looking at about 88 pounds of CO2 per artificial tree to make and bring here. An artificial tree will last about 10 to 20 years, but what do you do with them once they're spent? With plastics, with PVC, with metal, all of those things are what go into creating a fake Christmas tree. And when it goes to the landfill, do those things decompose? No, they don't. Whereas a real tree can be repurposed and turned into mulch. There are alternatives to both. You can rent a Christmas tree or think about buying one that you can plant or donate after the holidays. So there's a look at some of the facts. Whichever way you decide to go, artificial or real, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. We'll send it back to you in the studio.
wishing you a happy holidays for sure. Sean, thanks. So Santa Claus and his reindeer are now out at Balboa Park. All of the museums there are ready for the holiday season as well. And one particular exhibit caught our attention. Christmas ornaments so ornate and sparkly that they look like jewelry made by two San Diego artists. CBS Aid's Anna Laurel takes us to the Timken to get us in the holiday spirit. The Timken Museum of Art is especially spectacular this time of year. I'm going to give you our point of view when we opened the doors initially to see the jewels of the season. It took our breath away. It's a lot of the wow factor. Having over 900 ornaments on display, it's a visual feast. 900 intricate ornaments made by Florence Hoard and Elizabeth Schlappi, now hanging from little trees, a big tree, even making their own chandeliers, creating that perfect Christmas magic in the central gallery of the Timken Museum of Art. The ornaments that you see, no two are alike. They created these ornaments just based on their imagination and their passions. Hoard and Schlappi lovingly created these for 80 years, starting in 1959. They celebrate animals, culture and fashion, historic landmarks and things unique to San Diego. But it's how they designed and crafted these masterpieces that make them so striking. Each one is so unique. You have ones that are very whimsical and they celebrate Mickey Mouse and as I mentioned, San Diego history. And then you have ones that are very elegant and have gemstones and different filigree that the ladies collected. The Timken now owns the ornament collection, a treasure trove of pieces made with simple and intricate braids, enameled in glass beads, charms, trims, tassels, and gemstones. They are so ornate. They're held together just with pins. So if you look very closely, you can see the pearl pins. They did not use any glues when they were fabricating these ornaments, so they're very delicate. Each start with traditional silk wrapped balls, then the embellishments of beads, sequins, and fabric. I love I love this ornate one down here. Maybe it's because it, there are shades of it that remind me of some of our uh, paintings in the French gallery. Come pick your favorite if you can decide and do what many do. Take a Christmas picture in front of the tree. At the Timken Museum of Art, this is Anna Laurel for CBS 8. Uh. I'm so glad we featured that so beautiful and as we are right in the heart of the holiday season, it also means tamale season. CBS 8 visited Barrio Star in Bankers Hill this week. The restaurant offers three kinds of tamales, chicken, pork and vegan. If you want to see our interview with the chef, head to CBS 8 as always, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for staying informed. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Dave. Take good care.